Okay, welcome to the February edition of the Conservation Outcomes webinar series. My name is Elizabeth Creech, and I am a Natural Resources Communication Specialist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, Resource Inventory and Assessment Division. We host this webinar series to provide key findings, data, and tools to support producers and partners in pursuing voluntary conservation efforts across the nation's working lands. We'll get started with today's presentation in just a moment, but first, a few logistics. If you would like to receive email notifications with information on upcoming webinars, please subscribe to the NRCS Conservation Outcomes topic via Gov Delivery. You may do so by following the instructions on the screen. We will place the link you can use to access the Gov Delivery subscription webpage in today's chat. As mentioned earlier, today's webinar is being recorded. If you have issues with audio, sometimes computer or mobile device headsets can help with quality and volume. It may also help to log out and back into this webinar session. You may access live captions during this webinar by clicking the three dots with the word more at the top of your screen. This will enable you to select the turn on live captions function. Please note that we will post additional links and resources in the chat today as well. One important web page to highlight is our Conservation Outcomes webinar series webpage. That URL, nrcs.usda.gov slash conservation dash outcomes dash webinar is displayed on the screen. We will also share the link in the chat. This webpage is where you can find resources from today's event, such as a one-page additional resources guide, and our presenter slide deck. Finally, we encourage everyone to type questions or comments in the chat. We will address as many of your questions as we can at the end of today's event. If we don't get to your questions, please email my colleague, Amy Overstreet at amy.overstreet at usda.gov, and we will follow up with you. With that, it's time to get started. I am pleased to turn the microphone over to Dan Malarkey, NRCS Resource Assessment Branch Leader. Great, thanks Creech. Welcome everybody uh, to the latest installment of NRCS's Conservation Outcome Webinar Series. As you know, NRCS has a long history of working with farmers and ranchers to help them conserve the natural heritage and sustainability of their operations. <clears throat> These recurring webinars give us a way to communicate to our stakeholders the importance of voluntary conservation programs and the funding provided through the Farm Bill for these efforts, and to highlight some of the documented outcomes in terms of natural resource and economic benefits. For nearly 20 years now, our Conservation Effects Assessment Project, or SEEP, has been documenting outcomes of our work on a variety of resource concerns. SEEP works closely with our science partners and other federal agencies and academia. Findings are used to inform improved conservation delivery for NRCS and to support strengthened management decisions across the nation's farms, ranches, and working forests. Today's webinar will give us a chance to look at both scientific and economic assessments of restoration efforts in longleaf pine forests, which represent some of the world's most biologically diverse ecosystems. Outcomes shared uh, <clears throat> from this project may be used by forest landowners, government agencies, and conservation partners to inform management decisions and guide initiatives in longleaf pine restoration on private lands. I appreciate you all being with us today, and now I'd like it to turn it over to Carrie Ann Hattishell, Acting NRCS SEEP Grazing Lands Leader, to introduce our guest presenter. Thank you, Dan. Chambers English is pursuing his MS at the University of Georgia in the Dwaviti Forest Sustainability Lab, studying the economic and hydrologic trade-offs of restoration scenarios in the Southeast. His studies have included work at the Jones Center in rural southwestern Georgia, which has been focused on modeling the effects of longleaf pine restoration on ecosystem services 
in the Itchway Notchway Basin. The Jones Center has supported over 130 graduate students on site to conduct research to complete their MS and PhD degrees. Chambers is passionate about natural resource policy, land management, and their impacts on human communities. He earned his BA in Earth and Environmental Sciences and Philosophy from Furman University in South Carolina in 2019, and has worked on U.S. Fish and Wildlife Prescribed Burn Teams, Environmental Education, and Ecological Research from Georgia to New Mexico. I would like to welcome our presenter, Chambers English, to deliver his presentation. All right, thanks so much, Carrie Ann. Before we get started, I'd like to thank again, uh, Carrie Ann and all of our partners at NRCS, my advisors at the Jones Center at Itchaway and the University of Georgia, and all the outstanding partners, mentors, and professionals um, that make longleaf restoration and forest management possible in the Southeast. Today, we'll be addressing a few management challenges uh, that landowners face in the southeastern United States. Landowners face real and perceived economic barriers with native longleaf pine restoration. Drought period hydrology leads to declining aquatic biodiversity in some southeastern streams. And finally, the forest restoration of longleaf or lopolly pine uh, may offer landscape scale benefits, but the cost to producers and partners must be quantified. A couple of key takeaways to keep in mind as we start our talk today are that open pine management may improve wetland hydrologic function during drought periods. Where strong pine straw markets exist, longleaf pine straw management for income is profitable even without financial assistance. Additional payments or restructuring of benefits could realize fuller ecological benefits of both loblolly and longleaf pine open systems. And lastly, loblolly open pine systems may even be more cost effective as a measure for water use management than longleaf. Longleaf pine ecosystems once spanned 90 million acres across the coastal plain of the southeastern United States. Characterized by a sparse overstory and diverse understory, uh, these forests held multiple age classes, uh, maintained through indigenous and lightning ignited fires. Uh, the gaps created through wind storms uh, allowed new regeneration to um, proceed in the forest. Today, these ecosystems host 29 threatened and endangered species. A combination of forces in the 19th and 20th century helped decimate uh, this ecosystem. In the 19th century, uh, heavy timbering of virgin longleaf forests began along river corridors and eventually expanded with the assistance of railroads. These cutovers made way for cotton production, and the longleaf forests that remained were severely degraded through fire suppression efforts by federal agents, um, well-intentioned but ignorant of the, uh, of the needs for fire in longleaf ecosystems at that time. Lastly, uh, forest conversion from longleaf to offsite loblolly pine species uh, helped grow the southeastern forest industry, but replaced this overstory species and the processes and species that rely on it. Globally, longleaf pine forests are one of the most endangered ecosystems compared to rainforest and even wetlands in the southeast. Only a fraction of our longleaf pine forests remain, less than 3% of their original extent. 
In 2007, a coalition of public and private partners, including NRCS, uh, convened to begin America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative, looking forward, uh, hoping to restore from a low of 4 million acres, this ecosystem to uh, 8 million acres in the 21st century. NRCS has been a strong partner uh, since the beginning of America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative in 2010, beginning the Longleaf Pine Initiative by mapping out priority counties throughout the Longleaf Range uh, based on their biological diversity and proximity to existing protected lands. NRCS remains a leader in longleaf pine establishment on private lands in 2021, accounting for over 52,000 acres of longleaf established on private lands, also contributing to practices like site prep and prescribed burning. Additionally, um, fire rake installment for stand improvement of existing stands have been funded through environmental quality incentives program, um, financial assistance, and across the range, uh, these incentives for private landowners um, totaled over $30 million uh, in 2021. So a substantial, substantial investment by NRCS in our private lands. Elsewhere in USDA, the Farm Service Agency has contributed over 250,000 acres uh, established through the CRP program on marginal croplands where longleaf is established to reduce erosion and planted with native warm season grasses uh, to foster habitat for species of concern. On our public lands, the U.S. Forest Service has led a million acre challenge to establish and manage longleaf um, on national forest and by 2022, we're over 80% complete. So um, this anchor of well-managed longleaf uh, is essential to the overall success of um, longleaf restoration. But the, despite, despite these investments um, on public and private lands, uh, there remains some work to be done. Um, US uh, Forest Service inventory and analysis data suggests that there may be over 3 million acres left to go to reach that 8 million um, acre goal set by America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative. So we've only seen um, a few hundred thousand acres net increased uh, since the 2012 cycle of FIA um, inventories. Looking at the age distribution of longleaf stands on private land and public land, we can begin to see um, where the gaps in our restoration efforts may be. So on this graph, we see the change in acres from 2012 to 2020, um, with substantial increases in younger age classes, modest increases in older age classes, but in our middle age stands, uh, 40 to 70 years, we're seeing declines. And um, this decrease in, um, in forest stands in this middle age is keeping, uh, keeping private lands from seeing fuller ecological potential of longleaf. And this, this is a sobering reality. Uh, we all want to see these systems come back and the ecosystem services that they provide, um, but we've we've got a ways to go. And some conservation leaders point to a few uh, potential solutions through uh, continued investment in private lands restoration, since the Southeast is uh, owned in a vast majority by private landowners. Corporate partnerships, uh, potentially with Timberland, uh, investors and managers that help scale up um, and 
increase the efficiency of conservation of thus investments. And lastly, fee simple and easement acquisitions um, to bolster our long leaf base. Emerging ecosystem service markets may help change the value proposition of forest management, which doesn't provide um, traditional timber product value. So the, the forest carbon market has taken the world by storm in the past few years um, where landowners are compensated to grow additional um, trees on their on their property uh, to store above ground carbon. And in some watersheds, landowners have been incentivized um, through financial incentives or assistance and easements uh, to protect forest lands for water quality. But we'll be discussing today the potential uh, value of an ecosystem service market for water quantity in watersheds where flow is an issue. So in parts of the coastal plain, center pivot irrigation uh, began in earnest in the 1970s, drawing groundwater uh, water resources to irrigate agricultural fields with corn, cotton, uh, peanuts, and other row crops. And in streams like the Ichaway Notchaway Creek in the lower Flint River Basin, where there's a substantial groundwater and surface water interaction, um, this has had uh, negative impacts on aquatic habitats in the watershed. So in this graph here, we see um, the low flow curves for um, the Itchaway Notchaway Creek before and after irrigation began. And we see after pumping, uh, those low flows uh, drastically uh, diminish um, from the withdrawal of groundwater resources uh, that no longer can go to feed surface water streams in this karst um, interactive environment. And during drought periods when uh, stretches of the Itchaway Notchaway and other area streams are drawn down sufficiently, um, aquatic species of concern may lose habitat connectivity or complete living conditions in their pools during low flows. So for threatened and endangered species and the producers uh, growing row crops, uh, water quantity is an issue in these watersheds. Substantial research and investment has gone to improve agricultural irrigation efficiency and even um, create markets to compensate producers to shut off their irrigation during times of drought. But these solutions are costly and insufficient to reach the whole uh, issue of water scarcity. Growing body of research has suggested that improved forest management of adjacent uplands may improve the hydrology of uh, these streams. So we'll be looking at, in particular, the pine plantations in the Notchway watershed, uh, shown here in red, adjacent to the streams. Now, these upland areas are actually mostly Loblolly pines today. Uh, although they are native pine species to the Piedmont and coastal plain, they were traditionally found in uh, wetter sites and uh, kept out of the uplands from, uh, from the longleaf sites through fire. Uh, but they show superior um, growth and productivity, and because of that are the bedrock of the timber industry in the southeast that annually provides billions of dollars um, and thousands of jobs to the region. So as we look to the upland systems for a potential solution to water flow, we must consider both Loblolly 
and long leaf management. And by improving upland management, we're really affecting one step in the water cycle, transpiration from plants, where if there's more, essentially if there's more trees and on a given acre of forest land, um, they should use more water. And if we reduce that number, we reduce the transpiration. So um, precipitation and groundwater that come through the forest uh, will stay and eventually flow into streams to sustain um, our aquatic habitats and producer supplies uh, for water. Now, longleaf savannas and open pine systems have several advantages uh, that lend themselves towards uh, management for water supply. They have a sparse overstory. So the large trees that use the most water, uh, there's really not that many of them. Um, a grass dominated understory uh, is maintained through biennial or um, prescribed fire, keeping out water thirsty um, hardwoods that may encroach on the site from, from wet areas. And longleaf themselves have drought hardy plant adaptations uh, that help shut off uh, water use during drought periods. But Lobali savannas and other open systems have many of the same benefits. Uh, sparse overstory, a grass dominated understory maintained through prescribed fire, but there's less research suggesting their uh, drought hardy uh, advantages compared to longleaf. In light of this, uh, reframing our management concerns, we have a couple of research questions we've hoped uh, to address. First, what are the economic barriers for landowners to adopt forest restoration, whether through Lobali or longleaf? What are the hydrologic impacts of restoring longleaf pine savannas compared to other forest management scenarios? How could landscape scale restoration improve water flows and at what cost? So let's dive in. We use an integrated modeling approach that incorporates forest planning, vegetation modeling, discounted cash flow analysis for our economic component, and lastly, hydrological modeling. A couple of key assumptions that we make about private landowners is that land is an asset and a liability. It's worth a lot of money uh, in some cases, but it requires continuous management and upkeep. And uh, open pine systems require persistent management, as we'll see. Private landowners are diverse in objectives and approaches, but generally share uh, cost avoidance and profit maximization. So um, landowners be incentivized to seek financial assistance for their cost and manage their land to increase uh, current and future profits uh, that they may get. But as I said, private landowners are diverse and some value wildlife, aesthetics, recreation, and other values more than strict economics. But at some point, the bills do have to get paid. So to draw a financial distinction from long rotation practices, which improve ecosystem health, we modeled uh, both longleaf pine and loblolly management at denser overstory stocking um, at shorter rotations um, aimed at increasing landowner income. And for longleaf, this includes pine straw raking from age 10 to the first thinning. Um, and both scenarios were harvested when net present value was maximized. Um, our restoration scenario aimed to draw an ecological distinction from our short rotation practices, which maximize income, namely by um, more intensively thinning our overstory trees to a basal area or density of 40 to 70 feet squared per acre, uh, incorporating biennial prescribed fire. And actually 
facilitating uh, and planting the native warm season grasses and pollinators um, that help complete um, a level of restoration um, needed by some species of concern in these systems. And these are based on um, literature from NRCS, academia, and practices of both public and private reserves. To give you a visualization of these management scenarios that we're investigating, um, it's essentially a two by two matrix where we have uh, both longleaf and loblolly uh, shown on the bottom managed at high densities um, to maximize uh, timber production and pine straw, as you can see on the forest floor, and contrast that to our restoration scenarios in the top two panels. In those, we have a sparse overstory, uh, a recently burned understory in the in the longleaf restoration panel, but both have an herbaceous uh, understory and uh, a sparse overstory. So thinking back to our uh, hydrologic cycle uh, slide, which which do you think will use more water in transpiration? Probably the dense income management stance. So to assess the uh, financial implications of our management scenarios, we use net present value and annualized equivalency value, uh, two financial metrics of um, profit for forest management and, and other sectors of finance. So the three main elements of these calculations are the revenues or cost incurred um, during that management, I, the discount rate or uh, alternate rate of return. If you didn't, if you didn't invest this money in forestry, you could put it in treasury bonds or a CD. What might you make at that rate? And then T, time, how far in the future might you get this income or delay that cost? As an example, we'll just look at $100 at a 5% discount rate. So if we have $100 today, that's great. Money in the pocket, we can take it to the bank. Um, five years in the future, its net present value is only $78. And if uh, we're promised that $100 10 years from now, it's only worth 61. That represents the lost time value of money that uh, we could have could have made if we had that money sooner and invested it. Forest landowners and managers um, deal with a lot of um, negative cash flows and only a few, um, sometimes only a few positive cash flows uh, while planning uh, and executing their forest management. So at the start of a rotation, the forest must be site prepped um, and trees planted that cost a sizable amount of money, but, so, but is a one-time expense during the life of a stand. And for our longleaf restoration scenario here, we account for prescribed fire every two years. That costs money. And um, annually, we've got to maintain fire breaks, um, roads, and pay our taxes. And all this, um, unless outside money from the landowner is financing the, the operation, has to be recouped through timber revenue. And those come very periodically in this example, um, only four times in a hundred year span. Because of the outsized role that USDA programs play in private lands restoration, we also wanted to quantify the impacts of financial assistance programs um, on the value proposition of each forest management scenario. So we included um, the base CRP um, assistance, which is 50%, uh, a sign-up incentive, and a 10-year rental payment. 
excuse me, based on the averages in our region. And although there's a range of assistance uh, offered through EQIP, we assume 75% of the practices we employed. And as we dive into our results for the financial section, um, bear in mind our matrix here. Longleaf and Law Bali managed either at high densities for income or low density for restoration. First, Longleaf Pine. Uh, on our X axis, we have site index or forest productivity. Um, the higher the number, the more inherent growth potential there is in the soil for the species. On the Y axis, we have annualized equivalency value, and that's essentially uh, the amount of money made every year um, through that rotation. And what we see is that in purple, our longleaf restoration scenario only broke even at above a $0 uh, threshold with substantial financial assistance. On the other hand, where pine straw markets are um, are hot, are active, we see in green that all of our longleaf straw scenarios um, made positive returns. They made the landowner money instead of costing the landowner money like a longleaf restoration scenario uh, with no financial incentive. And where CRP is considered uh, that the highest green dash line there with triangle markers, um, it's pretty substantial annual income um, to be expected from that forest. For Lobbolly Pine, uh, again, we have the same forest productivity um, adjusted for the, the species differences in growth there. Um, but we see that every scenario, regardless of uh, financial assistance, breaks even and makes money uh, with these assumptions. And um, yeah, even even the the restoration scenario without cost without uh, cost share or financial uh, assistance, um, without any financial assistance, the uh, Loblolly income management is making sixty to seventy five dollars an acre. And if we go back to Longleaf, depending on the site. CRP uh, is starting to compete with that. So um, in parts of Georgia, for instance, we've seen um, pine straw markets explode in the um, CRP investment areas. And this is why it's it's making landowners solid money uh, and competing with and even exceeding uh, Loblolly without cost share um, in some areas. But this is not all about money. Um, let's dive in to the hydrological impacts um, that give context to uh, our economic analysis. So what we see here on the x-axis is our planning horizon, um, 100 years for all the scenarios. And on the y-axis, we have the water yield uh, from a given acre. And um, what we see in the in the um, line chart is an uptick in water yield every time the forest is thinned. So at year zero, um, the water yield is high for every scenario because there's very few trees using water. And as the trees age and grow dense, they use more water. And in our dashed lines representing restoration scenarios, um, these stands are thinned uh, more heavily and more frequently than our income scenarios. So they trend upwards in water yield um, faster and overall much higher than our income scenarios um, modeled out 
these whole hundred year um, cycles. And based on the rotation length, average water yield, we can begin to get um, a more holistic picture of the impacts these management scenarios have on water supply. So if we use Loblolly timber uh, as our baseline for comparing, um, given its prominence in our state for producing uh, fiber, we start to see the advantages of potential management changes um, to our other scenarios. So by far, long leaf restoration showed the greatest increase in water yield um, with 144% increase over the rotation length. Um, long leaf straw showed some increase at 58%, um, but loblolly restoration somewhere in the middle um, at 103% increase uh, in rotation length, average water yield over our baseline loblolly timber. But these results uh, are nuanced and um, they matter for uh, policy application. So um, from that previous slide, we see that uh, strictly in terms of gallons of water yield per acre, uh, longleaf restoration is clearly advantageous and superior to other forest management scenarios. But because of its um, financial value, positive financial value, and um, its elevated water yield benefits as well, Loblolly uh, pine restoration may offer the best value in terms of dollars per gallon um, investment. So if a landowner or manager is limited by space, investing in longleaf may be advantageous, but if they're more constrained by uh, budget, um, Loblolly restoration may show some benefit. And because of the prominence of um, Loblolly on the landscape, we should also consider the time to benefit instead of um, replanting uh, a longleaf stand that then grows dense and uses a lot of water before it can be thinned, we could potentially intervene with existing Loblolly stands, thin them down to restoration prescriptions, and see more immediate um, hydrologic and other e ecological benefits. But these, um, the ecosystem service objectives of each landowner are different, and they should be quantified um stated and and measured um so some some landowners looking to maximize um absolute wildlife habitat value um, may choose to go for longleaf over loblolly restoration because of its benefits um, to fuel continuity and value for some of our species of concern Long-term commitments are certainly needed to help us shift that um, forest demographics chart from a negative to a positive in those middle-aged stands. How do we get our young stands um, from age 20, age 30 uh, into older ages and more desired forest structures? So um, contracting with existing longleaf stands and even um, Loblolly stands may be an opportunity um, to improve and retain um, quality forest structure and ecosystem services. The carbon offset markets uh, offer an example for, for how this might be incentivized where um, because of the above ground carbon um, stored in trees, landowners have been paid to plant more trees, grow them longer, or otherwise manage um, to increase carbon 
above some baseline. But scientists have noted general hydrologic trade-offs um, for carbon management in forest and specific regional ecological impacts um, when we consider longleaf pine. So thinking back to our transpiration, growing more trees densely for a longer period, it's likely to use more um, local water supply. And for longleaf pine, characterized by an open, um, open forest and uh, sparse overstory, um, prescribed fire will not be able to have the positive effects um, from sunlight reaching the floor and providing the herbaceous ground cover uh, that many plants uh, and animals need to thrive in this ecosystem. So carbon and water may have um, global and local partitioning of the ecosystem service marketplace as this develops, uh, since water scarcity is inherently local and um, the carbon market is global. Both are inherently tied to um, climate and climate issues as droughts become more intense. Um, but this may drive an even higher premium for uh, restoring open pine systems if there's a greater incentive for landowners to manage at high densities. Um, an area of uncertainty that's being addressed by longleaf scientists right now is the below ground carbon stocks. Uh, we can see visually that um, a thinned forest doesn't hold as much wood, um, and that's been quantified, but um, the the root mass of long living trees and the, the grass stock as well may change the balance for carbon in long leaf stands, but there's a trade off there. The carbon market does offer a model uh, for us to consider when we think about managing for water yield. It'll take a long term commitment to compensate landowners if they're motivated um, by the timber value um, that they lose while managing um, restoration scenarios. Simply planning and walking away is not going to work to see the full ecological benefits of our open pine systems. So two options might be um, additional conservation or purchased easements for uh, forest properties in watersheds of concern or contracting um, an annual payment system to manage at these lower densities. And based on the discounted cash flows that we produced, for each uh, for each site index or forest productivity, we can begin to estimate some conservative um, values for both of those options um, of compensating landowners. Uh, regardless, longleaf restoration costs two to three times as much as loblolly uh, restoration from a baseline of loblolly income, um, but there are fuller um, hydrologic benefits and additional ecological benefits uh, that come with this management. As we wrap up, uh, let's review our key takeaways for the day. First, open pine system management may improve wetland hydrologic function during drought periods. Loblolly open pine systems may even be a more cost effective measure for water use management as well. Where strong pine straw markets exist, longleaf pine straw is profitable without financial assistance, and additional payments or restructuring of benefits could realize the full benefits of loblolly and longleaf open pine systems. Looking ahead, uh, we'll be working to uh, prioritize and optimize uh, management interventions within target watersheds um, and quantify the local stream impacts of our restoration efforts. So if we can increase our flows at a specific point in the stream, 
during drought periods by three CFS, will that be enough to sustain the population of endangered uh, mussels there and even sustain the, the pumping from nearby agricultural producers? And finally, we're hoping to work with our partners to bring a forest to water market to life here in Georgia and beyond. With that, I'll uh, take any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chambers. We appreciate your presentation. We have a couple comments that came in um, as well as questions in the chat. So we're going to start with um, a comment that was uh, made by Balta. And thank you for that comment, by the way. Balta asked, and this is one I'll answer, Chambers. Uh, Balta asked about a six acre parcel that was in the past timberland can it apply for conservation financial assistance for efforts to grow longleaf pines and develop this land for lost ecosystems in this land in northern Florida. So I went ahead and um, put down below so that everyone can can see this in the chat that if you'd like to reach out to a local NRCS service center, um, we did put the link for uh, how to locate an NRCS service center. For everyone, it's always best with a question like that to reach out to the local NRCS folks since they'll know the um, the way to answer that question for their for their region. Um, so uh, this is the first question I have for you, Chambers. Does NRCS allow pine straw harvesting when using equip funds, not CRP, to establish the stand? You might you might know that you might not. If you don't, we can answer that on our side. Um, but I know you've worked with some NRCS offices. I do not know about EQIP. Um, I know that CRP does not allow it during the contract period, um, but from my understanding, EQIP contracts are shorter um, and provide only establishment uh, funds. So um, after the contract is up, most likely so, but I'll, I'll defer to NRCS expertise on that. Sure, uh, Kent, we're going to go ahead and um, suggest again that you go ahead and contact your local NRCS office. Uh, again, I did put that link um, in the chat. Uh, this is one chambers that uh, I think that directs, directly relates to your work. Um, were herbicide applications considered in the cost of man managing Loblolly stands? And were hunting lease payments considered in the income potential of both stand types? So we did uh, account for herbicide application as part of the site preparation cost for both species. Um, and a modest hunting lease was included um, in both scenarios as well. Uh, generally, these are modeled um, or quantified just enough to cover the taxes and management, um, but we've seen in some markets that this goes well well beyond so um, there's certainly some room to improve the modeling efforts there where there's some hunting lease premiums um, associated with open pine systems because of their aesthetics and wildlife habitat thanks for the question Great, thanks. And we have one that um, we'd like you to just touch on again. You you hit on this uh, a little bit already, but uh, what do you think are the key points that you want to recommend to land managers um, that they should consider when using your findings to inform management decisions in private southeastern forests? Yeah, so where there are um, streams with low flow concerns are geographically isolated wetlands, as you may learn in future uh, webinars, uh, managing pine systems to more open um, natural structure benefits the hydrology and aquatic life of those systems. Uh, but managers should balance that or understand the economic uh, consequences and plan accordingly so that they can finance um, the continued maintenance of open pine systems required through um, prescribed fire and other property maintenance and taxes through the years. Great. 
Great. Thank you, Chambers. I'm looking to see if there are any questions I missed in the chat. It looks like those are all the questions that were that were placed here for now. And so with that, I think I'm going to pass it over to um, pass it back over to Creech. Thanks so much, Chambers. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chambers. Thank you so much, Carrie Ann. So a big thanks also to Dan and our behind the scenes webinar coordinator, Amy Overstreet. Once again, please visit the Conservation Outcomes webinar series webpage. The link is in the chat where you can access the one pager of additional resources and today's slide deck. Please email Amy and I'll say that uh, email address one more time. It's amy.overstreet at usda.gov with any follow up questions we did not address today and we'd be happy to support with those. We will post the recording of today's webinar on our NRCS Conservation Outcomes webinar webpage that we highlighted earlier. There, we also have recordings of past webinars and details on how to subscribe to the Gov Delivery email I mentioned at the beginning of this session. And one more time, that page URL also in the chat is nrcs.usda.gov slash conservation dash outcomes dash webinar. Finally, we want to highlight our next Conservation Outcomes webinar, which is scheduled for April 27th at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. This webinar will focus on isolated wetlands and southeastern pine forests, modeling and tool development to predict water yield outcomes of forest management. Additional details will be posted to our Conservation Outcomes webinar series webpage in the coming weeks, and by next Thursday, we will have this webinar recording available. So we hope to see you in April. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Have a great afternoon.